Bon dia! Good to see you all. Welcome at Assembly 2023. Welcome to Lisbon, great city. Um, thanks also to everyone for making the long trip, for a lot of you from the US to come over here to see what we are up to. This weekend, or actually this entire week, is going to be wild. We have a lot of things that, that are coming up. A lot of presentations today and tomorrow about new products, a lot of cultural panels. It's going to be, as you know from us, a mix of like everything we love. Um, next week, Urban Week, it's going to be super exciting from float tanks to chess tournaments to you know, your demo day where we're going to have a um, grand judging of the hackathon prices. Um, so the coming week is going to be a lot of fun. And I think that's what we're all here for. And to see all the exciting new products. If you haven't gotten it yet, by, by the way, we have a merch store upstairs where you can all get your merch for this week. Um, you should definitely check that out. And um, first up today, we're going to start with the executive director of the Urit Foundation, Josh Lehman. Good morning, everybody. Real quick, can we just give a big shout out to Thomas for making this whole thing come together? Thanks, man. All right. So I've obviously called this talk Urban Inside. Um, all right. So recently I was watching this talk uh, from a guy named Alan Kay. Uh, a lot of you probably know who he is. He's kind of a legendary computer scientist. He's known for being the inventor of the personal computer, right? And not in the way that we think about it, like he just came up with the computer, but he came up with all these technologies back in the 70s that we consider foundational to, uh, to personal computing today, right? Now, he did this at this organization called Xerox Park. They did an absolutely ridiculous number of crazy shit back in the 70s, right? And they invented things like the graphical user interface, object-oriented programming, the mouse, Ethernet, also the laser printer, which ended up becoming kind of an obvious thing given that it was Xerox Park. The things they did were totally remarkable, right? Especially for the time. And in this talk of Alan's, one of the things he, he, he mentions is he had this, this phrase he would use when he's thinking about the concept of invention that he would begin with, which is, in 30 years, it would be ridiculous if we didn't have blank. And it, this framework, I think, is you know, really important because what it's about is thinking non-incrementally. Right? When we think about, OK, how do I solve this problem right now, we do so when we're as a, from, a frame, from a mindset of being locked into the technology of the day. Like, what can I use right now in order to solve this problem? But if we expand the timeline, we're now thinking in terms of, OK, well, I can just make shit up, and then what do I want to see happen in the world? Right? And that's sort of the basis for invention. He, he goes on to elaborate and talk about this idea of solving for contexts rather than problems. And the analogy he uses is, imagine you're in a canyon, right? you're moving through it. Your context is you've got these walls all around you, and the things that you're confronted with are the obstacles that you encounter well, right here, here's a boulder. Here's a you know, large well in the river that I have to get through. But if you were to climb out of that canyon, which may be kind of difficult, but if you climb out of that canyon, all those problems are gone. Now you're in a totally different context. And so a lot of times with technology, the problems we're solving are, they only really exist because of the tools that we're working with today. If we change the context, if we manage to create something totally new, all of those problems effectively just disappear. Because now we have a totally different frame for operating in the world. So, OK, all this got me thinking about Urbit's timeline. All right, about 10 years ago, almost exactly 10 years ago, uh, Tlon was formed, 2013. About 10 years prior to that, this guy named Curtis, got the idea for Urbit, and I don't know how much 
work on Urbit was happening during that 10 years because he was also doing some, some blogging. Uh, but, you know, ostensibly he did some work on Urbit and he had this idea for this thing and I wondered like, okay, well, if Curtis were going through Alan Kay's exercise, how would it have gone, right? Okay, in 30 years it would be ridiculous if we didn't have, well, I think the completion to that would have been personal servers. And that bears a little bit of elaboration, okay? Okay, so going to the 20 aughts during this frame, what was happening in the world, because we're all moving to the cloud, right? All the billboards were about cloud stuff, right? You go to an airport, there's all these billboards about the cloud, I remember it, seeing on all these business magazines. Uh, all the things that we used to do on PCs throughout the mid-2000s into, you know, the 20 teens, everything was moving to the cloud. We stopped using personal computers for so much as a gateway except to access cloud software. Our documents were moving there, right? Our file management, our games. I don't think this was a bad thing, right? This made a lot of sense. It ushered in an absolutely remarkable wave of innovation, right? Suddenly we had computers in our pockets that were available largely because we could offload computation and storage to devices that were outside of our immediate periphery. They were somewhere much more secure. They operated much more efficiently. We could collaborate to a much greater degree. When we inevitably dropped these devices in toilets, we didn't lose everything, okay, which is really important. But there were a lot of people that thought, hey, we're you know, we're probably losing something here, right? There are a lot of ideals from early on in the invention of software that we're giving up when we move all these things to the cloud, right? One of these movements that some of you might recognize is the free software movement, right? Which is about freedom as in, or free as in freedom, not beer, right? The idea that software should, because it is information, it should be liberated. I should be free to distribute software, to modify it, okay? To study it, use it, whatever I want. They weren't the only ones that were you know, concerned about this and had some ideas. The cypherpunk movement is another one. Right? They came at this from a totally different angle, the idea that privacy is a fundamental human right. They were the ones that really pushed the idea of cryptography, uh, pretty good privacy, PGP. These were, these, both of these groups, they were fighting for the idea of the empowerment of individuals. Right? They believed that individuals should have access to the best tools they possibly can, and that creates the best possible society that we can have. But, the market wanted the cloud, right? What the cloud could offer was actually really awesome, right? These things drive our daily lives, okay? They're, they're good, right? They actually are pretty good. Most people, they didn't really care very much about privacy if it made their lives even slightly harder. This shut the door on some of these early dreams, the idea that I could actually evolve software, I could, I could take something, I could make modifications to it, it could become mine. Right? This is something people thought about in the early days, but it started to kind of go out the window when everything moved to the cloud, because you really cannot go and modify something that is running on somebody else's server. It just doesn't make sense, because how are you going to modify something for your own needs if it has to serve everybody? Right? There's, just a, there's just a mismatch there. Okay, now, the other thing that happened is our software became really, really sophisticated. And so even though we were losing this you know, this ideal of being able to modify our software, well, at the end of the day, people couldn't really do that anyway because the stuff was so damn hard to build in the first place, right? Even for the people that actually build it, right? These days, it's practically impossible to even build a new web browser, even as a massive company. Like, you just couldn't do this from the ground up because these things are so, so complicated. All right, so coming back to this, right? This should make a little bit more sense now, a personal server, right? What we wanted was to have our cake and eat it too. We want the convenience and capability of the cloud, but we also want to keep our privacy, and we want this idea of being able to go and modify our software, right, extend it over time, have it evolve with us, right? The dream was that you could actually do this, right? We can have personal servers that don't mean that we have to give up on the dream of personal computing, right? In order to have personal servers, though, you have to, there's a few problems, right? <laughs> you have to, make them easy enough for anyone to run and maintain and use, right? In order to make them that easy, you're gonna to have to go and solve this gigantic problem of complexity in software. In order to solve that complexity problem, well, you need a totally different architecture, right? You need something that actually emphasizes simplicity at the lowest levels of the stack, right? In data and in code. And that's Urban.
It's a new stack that's designed for simplicity at those lowest levels, designed to last forever, designed to evolve alongside you. And Urbit is really about bringing freedom back, right? We want freedom in software. This is not something that we're ready to give up on. The freedom to run whatever we want, the freedom to communicate with whoever we want, to access our information, leverage it in ways that we'd like to, right? And ultimately to tailor that software to our needs over time. All right, now this is increasingly important and people are picking up on this because computers are really woven into the fabric of our lives more and more and more on a daily basis. Right? We used to go to work and access them, and then they found their way into our homes, and then our pockets, and then our wrists. Right? And soon, they're actually going to be embedded in our brains. Right? That's actually happening now. We can talk to them. We can just talk to computers, and they can respond to us. Like, this is crazy shit. I, I don't totally know how it happened, but all of a sudden, we can just talk to computers, and that's, that's fine. Uh, you know, this is sci-fi. This is the cover of a book called Neuromancer where you know, <laughs> that stuff seemed pretty friggin' far out, and it sits here. Now, I think a lot of gut reaction to this is, is fear, right? Like, we're scared of losing control. And I don't think it needs to be scary. Because we have the technology to retain control and open the doors to a totally new frontier of interaction with computers. Right, that can be much more humane than it ever has been. Like, what I want is a computer that becomes a living extension of me, that grows alongside me. It should get to know me throughout my life. It should evolve, it should know my aspirations, my goals, the people that are important in my life. It should be able to do work for me to filter all that, like, that massive amount of incoming information. Right? Help me figure out how to make sense of it all, what's actually important. It should make sure that it doesn't give me any bad news in the morning before I've had my coffee, because it knows when I have my coffee, it knows what state of mind I'm in, it knows what's important. If something needs to be escalated, it can do it. Right? These, are, these are things that are becoming possible. But in order to have this, right, there are some characteristics that we, we like really need to get right. right. It needs to be flexible enough to be personalized. It has to be able to modify itself to grow with me. It has to last for pretty much ever. If you know, this is a land cruiser. They last pretty much forever. Right? It needs to be kind of like that. It's just never going to die. And the most important thing is that you need to be able to trust the damn thing. Right? I have to trust it to a much greater degree than I'm used to trusting really anything ever. It's, you know, like brain-computer interfaces, they are here. To think that you could give a computer access to your literal thoughts is absolutely crazy. But it could happen, right? Giving a computer access to my messages, well, that's one thing. But to my thoughts, like, it's, it's a totally qualitatively different thing. And I know I'm not alone in thinking that what you're going to need to be able to trust that kind of system is not something that we otherwise have available today. And it's really important. Your computer is going to be, basically be responsible for your cognitive security. Right? And you really do not want to outsource that to anybody. As far as I know, Urbit is the only system that is designed with these principles in mind, fundamentally. Which is why I'm really excited to put an Urbit in my brain. Right? That would actually be very cool. But, but not quite yet. Uh, it's going to need to be a lot faster. It's going to need to be a lot more reliable. Definitely much more secure. And so, you know, I, I, I want to think a little bit about how we get there, right? This is, this is in the domain of, in 30 years, it would be ridiculous if we didn't have orbits in our brain, right? We're in a position to think about that now. It's not crazy. It's tractable. How do we get there? Well, thankfully, this is a decentralized ecosystem, so it's, you know, it's all of your problem. Uh, okay, I'm kind of kidding. It is our problem. It is the Urban Foundation's problem to a large degree, but it is something that we're going to work out in conjunction, and I think we can do it. Now, one thing I can say, at the very least, is that Urban isn't like this anymore. I'll read this because it's kind of long. Hey, I like Urban. It's clearly the OS of the future, and I'm just blown away by how perfect, almost godlike it is in its encoded architecture, etc. The only problem at this point is it doesn't do anything at all. It just sits there like a lump of poo on a stick. 
Okay, we may have heard this criticism before. Uh, okay, this isn't the case anymore. Right? You can get on it in seconds. It can connect us. It can entertain us. It can facilitate transactions. Right? All kinds of things that I never thought it would be able to do. The way we're going to get in urban, in urban into our brains is by continuing to build and experiment and do all kinds of crazy shit. Right? I'm really proud of this ecosystem. I'm proud to be part of it because there's so much variety and diversity on display in the things that people create. Right? So I'm glad you're here because you're going to see some of these things that are powered by Urbit today. And I hope that you'll be as excited as I am about the things that we can put to Urbit inside tomorrow. Thank you.